So let's see some more things we can do with indexing, continuing with the strings to program from the last video. Well, we can index backwards in a sequence by using a negative number. So parrot square brackets minus one will give the last character E. So let's uh, try this out. So I'm going to come down here and on line 14, I'm going to type print left to right parentheses just to make a blank line. Then on line 16, I'm going to type print parentheses parrot and as I mentioned, using square brackets, I put a minus one inside that square bracket. Now if we run that, all right, so we get an E printed after we ran the program, as you can see. Now note that minus zero doesn't really make sense here. So when counting from the end of the string, we start counting from minus one. So continuing on, if I type print on line 17, parentheses, parrot, and minus 14 in square brackets, and run the program, you can see we get the first N, the capital N, in the string. So I think a mini challenge will help solidify negative indexes. It's really a mini, mini challenge, so I'm not going to use a slide. What I will do is take a copy of lines 7 through 12, and what I'm going to do is copy over lines 16 and 17. All right, so the mini challenge is to change the indexes on lines 16 through 21 to use negative indexing. So we still want the message we win to be printed. So pause the video and come back when you want to see my solution. All right, welcome back. So to solve the challenge, we have to use the index positions from the end of the string where the last character is at position minus one. So that means the W is at position minus 11. So if I change the three there to minus 11, and run this, there's the first letter. And what we'll do is we'll go through and finish the rest now. The next one is minus 10. Next one, minus five. Next one, minus 11. Next one, minus eight. And the last one, minus six. And we can run this and verify we still get the output we win one character at a time. Now you may have noticed that the negative index values can be obtained by subtracting the string length 14 from the positive ones. So you may have actually done something like this and what I'll do is I'll take another copy of uh, lines 7 to 12. I'll come down here and I'm going to paste this down here on line 23. So again, what I said was uh, you may notice that the negative index values can be obtained by subtracting the string length 14 in this case from the positive numbers. So you may have done something like this, just basically subtracting 14 from each value. So instead of three, be three minus 14, four minus 14, nine minus 14, three minus 14, six minus 14, and lastly, eight minus 14. Run the program, and you can see there that uh, we still get the output we win, and what we could do to be consistent, we could add another print there. Run it again just to make sure we have got a space there, and we can see that we've still got we win. We've got basically three lots of we win showing on the screen, which is consistent with the fact that we've done this three times now. So experiment with uh, negative index values to make sure you're comfortable with how to use them. You won't use negative index as often as positive ones, but uh, when you do need to use them, they're incredibly useful. In the next video, we'll continue with strings and look at how to slice a string. See you in the next video. Python sequence types let you create a slice. The only sequence type we've looked at so far is the string type, so let's continue with our strings to program. What I'll do is delete all the code except for the comment and the uh, parrot definition. So let's go ahead and do that. So we can produce a slice by providing three numbers separated by colons. Now these numbers are the start, stop, and step values. So I'll introduce the step values soon, but first let's look at slicing without a step. So I'm going to type print parentheses parrot left square bracket zero colon six and right square bracket and then our right parentheses. I'm going to add a comment as well, hash n-o-w, sorry n-o-r-w-e-g. 
So here, we're telling Python to start at position 0 and slice up to, but not including, position 6. And I've added a comment with a hash character there to indicate the result that we should get. So if we run the program now, we get the output uh, in the output pane, Norweg. So when I said not including, that's important and something that new Python programmers often forget. The last character you specify isn't included in the slice. It turns out that not including that last character makes slices much easier to use, but it'll probably catch you out at first. In fact, not including that final value is something that happens in other places in Python, such as ranges. Now don't do this if you're at work in an open plan office, but if you're somewhere safe where you're not going to get funny looks, say out loud 10 times, up to but not including, up to but not including, up to but not including. All right, so getting back to our code, the, the uh, slice on line five produces the characters from index zero up to but not including index six. So let's see some more examples to understand how slices work. So let's say we wanted the characters we from the string, then we'd slice from position three, the w, up to but not including position five, the g. So let's type in the code for that. So on line six, I'm going to type print, left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, then we're going to type three column five by dimension, then our right uh, square bracket, right parentheses, and we'll run the program. We should see we outputted, and there's we in the output pane. So what else can we do? Well, we can get the first word by getting the slice from position zero up to, but not including, position nine. So let's try that. So print left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, zero colon nine, then our right to square bracket, right parentheses, and we'll run that. And there's the entire word, Norwegian. When creating a slice, the first value is the position to start at, as you've seen. That's separated from the position to stop at with a colon, which again you've seen. But if you don't provide a start value, you still need the colon. So we could write that last slice that we've got on line seven differently by typing print on line eight, a left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, then just colon nine this time, right square bracket, right parentheses, and we can run that. And as you see, we get exactly the same result. And that's this time, the difference is we didn't provide a start value. Basically our lines seven and eight both do the same thing because the start value defaults to the start of the sequence. And obviously on line seven, we included the start value and uh, line eight, we didn't include it. All right, so let's look at some slides to explain exactly what's going on here. So our first slice was uh, zero colon six. The slice starts at index position zero. And it then extends up to, but not including, position 6. The next slice was uh, 3 colon 5. So the slice starts at index position 3. And it extends up to, but not including, position 5. Then we had the slice 0 colon 9. This slice starts at index position 0. And it extends up to, but not including, index position 9. And as you saw, we can leave off the start value of zero because the start defaults to the beginning of the sequence. The colon is, however, necessary. Otherwise, we'd be specifying the single character at position nine. So at this point, you should be able to create a slice that returns the word blue. So pause the video and come back when you've had a go at that. All right, so welcome back. So to slice the word blue from our string, we need to start at position 10 and extend up to position 14. So let's do that. So I'm going to type print, left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, 10 colon 14, right square bracket, right parentheses. And if we run that, we should see the word blue. And there's blue on the screen. And again, there's no character at position 14, but remember that slices extend up to, but not including the stop value. We saw that we can leave out the start value and it'll, it uh, will default to the start of the sequence. If we leave out the stop value, then it defaults to the end of the sequence. So that means that we can rewrite the last line, line 10, on line 11, as print, left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, 10, colon, and this time we're leaving off the other value. So we've got a right square bracket and right parentheses. And if I run that, 
we get the same output, in this case the word blue. It's important to include the colon that separates the start and stop values. We haven't provided a stop value, but we still need the colon so that Python knows that we want a slice. Without the colon, that would be an index and we'd get a single character at position 10. I mentioned that there are four different things that square brackets are used for, and uh, slicing is the second thing. They're used for indexing and they're used for slicing. If you use square brackets for slicing, you must have at least one colon, otherwise it's in fact an index and not a slice. Alright, so I've got a question for you. Before I ask it, we'll have a quick recap. If the first number in a slice is omitted, the slice will start from the beginning of the string, and if the second number is omitted, it'll run to the end of the string. So it's a recap. Print parentheses parrot a square bracket colon six, right square bracket right parentheses, and print left parentheses parrot a square bracket six colon, then right square bracket and right parentheses. So again, the first number in a slice is omitted, the slice starts at the beginning of the string, and if the second number is omitted, it'll run to the end of the string. The slice uh, indices are defined such as string, square bracket, colon, n, plus string, square bracket, n, colon, is the same as the original string. So to show you what I mean, I'm going to type some code on line 16 this time, print, left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, colon, six, We've got a right square bracket, plus this time, I'm going to add a space there, so and a plus, another space, then parrot, left square bracket, six colon, then we've got our right square bracket and our right parentheses again. So if we run this, you can see in fact we've got the entire Norwegian blue outputted to the screen. So at this point, my question to you is, what happens if we only have a colon in the slice. In other words, what will this produce? Print, left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, colon, and right square bracket, parentheses. So have a think about that and see if you can figure it out before running the program. Pause the video now and come back when you've got an answer. All right, so welcome back. Did you work it out? Well, if you don't provide a start value, the slice starts at the beginning of the sequence. So there's no start value on line 18, so we start at the beginning. Now if you don't provide a stop value, the slice extends up to the end of the sequence. And we haven't got a stop value on line 18 either. So that means the slice will start at the beginning and extend right up to the end. So if we run the program now, we get the complete string printed out. So you might be wondering at this point why would we uh, want to do that? When dealing with strings, you probably wouldn't. And I'll come back to it when we look at another sequence type, a list. When dealing with lists, a slice like this one that produces a copy of the entire original can be very useful. I've covered it now because we're looking at start and stop values in a slice, and we'll see some practical applications of it later in the course. All right, I'm gonna stop the video here. Before watching the next video, experiment with slices with different strings. So a good one that you might wanna experiment with would be uh, this one, which I'll add to the source code. So letters equals, and we're going to add the letters of the alphabet. Like so. So that can be uh, a good uh, string to actually experiment with, but you can use any strings you want. Create some slices and make sure you get the results you wanted. Once you've done that, I'll see you in the next video. Continuing with our strings2 program, I'm going to delete everything except the definition of parrot on line 3 and also the first slice. The start, stop and step values in a slice can also be negative. So let's add some code on line 7, print, then left parentheses, parrot, left square bracket, minus 4, colon 2, right square bracket, then right parentheses. Now if we run this, we'll find that this actually doesn't print out anything. So it doesn't print the two characters starting four in from the end of the string, and it's printing nothing as I mentioned. And that's because you can't go backwards from the starting position. So instead, we'd have to write that as so minus four, which we've got, but then minus two. And as a comment, that should give us BL. And it's another example, print 
parentheses, parrot again, then left square bracket, minus 4, colon 12, right square bracket, right parentheses, then that will actually give us the same thing. So if we run this, you can see we've got BL in both cases there. So the first one on line 7, that prints from index minus 4, and that's B, capital B, up to, but not including the second to last character in the string, which is U. Now the second example on line 8 prints the same thing, but this time it's interpreted as from index minus 4, up to, but not including, index position 12. So spend some time experimenting with negative indices. There's nothing tricky about them. They're just counting from the end of the string instead of from the beginning. Make sure you can reproduce all the slices from the last video using negative indices. I'll do the one on line 5 just to get you started. And we'll do that just immediately under line 5. So the negative version of that would be print parentheses parrot square bracket minus 14 colon minus 8. Then when our right uh, square bracket, right parentheses, and that should give us the same result. So let's just run that to make sure that it works. And you can see we've got Norweg outputted twice. So again, make sure you go through and uh, reproduce all the slices from the last video using negative indices to uh, really make sure that you understand how they work. But also, with that said, create your own strings and practice on them as well. In the next video, we'll see how to use a step in our slices. See you in the next video. So far, we've only been providing two values to our slices, the start and stop values. But slices can also take a step value, which defaults to one. So let's see some examples before we discuss the syntax more formally. So what I'm going to do is delete the code other than the definition of parrot on line three. And I'm going to type on line five, print parentheses parrot square bracket zero colon six colon two and close up the square bracket and parentheses. And we'll put a comment to the effect of the output being capital N R E. And on line six, I'm going to type print parentheses parrot left square bracket zero colon six colon three this time then uh, right square bracket in parentheses and comment the output should be NW. So the slice on line 5 is starting from index 0, which is the capital N, extracting all the characters up to but not including index 6, which is the I, in steps of 2. So the slice starts at index position 0. It extends up to but not including position 6. And we step through the sequence again in steps of 2. Line 6 is similar, but slices in steps of 3. So here we can see that the slice starts at index position 0, as before. It extends up to, but not including position 6, again as before. But this time we're stepping through the sequence in steps of 3. So let's confirm that that works by running it. And you can see we get the output that we thought we should get. And you can see that we've got that output. Right, so another example of a slice with a step is as follows. So I'm going to start typing some code on line 8. We'll start by typing number equals, in double quotes, 9,223,372,036,854,775,807. And we've got a closing double quote there. Now on line 9, if I type print parentheses number, then square brackets again, 1, colon, colon, 4, then closing off the uh, right bracket and right parentheses. Now if we run that, it doesn't appear to be very useful, but it does illustrate using a step in slices. So it starts at position 1, which is the first comma, and it's slicing every fourth character. The list extends all the way to the end of the string, and that's because we've admitted the stop value, and that gives us all the commas. So I said it didn't appear to be useful, however it can be. In order to show you how it's useful, I'm going to have to use uh, some things that we'll be looking at later. I don't like doing this generally, and I won't be doing it often, but I think something like that slice will make more sense if you can see a practical application of it. So what I'm going to do is start by changing some of the separators. At the moment they're all commas, but it's possible we may have to process a string that contains a mix of separators. So what I'm going to do is I use a mix of commas, semicolons, colons, and spaces. 
These are all the things you might find used as separators when processing data. So we've got 9, 223. Let's change the uh, comma after the 223 to a semicolon. Then moving on, we've got to after 372, we'll replace that comma with a colon. The next one, after the 036, we'll put a space there instead. And we'll leave the next one, 854, we'll leave that as a comma. And the one down the end here, before the 807, we'll add a semicolon there as well. So if we run this program again now, we've changed those separators. You can see the output there, we've actually got a comma, semicolon, colon, space, comma, semicolon. So why is that useful? Well, if that number string represents seven values that appear in a data file, we can use the separator string to split out the seven values. Now this is the bit that I don't want you to worry about. Think of it as a demonstration. It's all stuff that you'll be learning about in later videos. So what I'm going to do is start by binding a variable to the slice instead of printing it out. So I'm going to change line nine there. Instead of print, we're going to type separators is equal to, and I'll just remove the parentheses on the end there. And then we're going to print separators. So we've now got a string containing all the separators that we used in numbers. Now it's not necessary to print it, but uh, on line 10 I'm doing that anyway, just to confirm that we've got the separators. And obviously that should work because we've just uh, only made a small change there by binding uh, it to the separators variable. Now we can use the separators to split out the individual values. So this is the uh, interesting part. So what I'm going to do is add that. I'm going to close down the, the uh, run window and uh, on line 12 I'm going to type values is equal to, then we've got uh, two double quotes, dot join, parentheses, char, if char not in separators, else a space in double quotes for char in number. Then we've got our right parentheses there to close that off. Then dot split left to right parentheses. Then on the next line, print parentheses. Then we've got our square bracket. Int left parentheses val space for val in values. We've got a closing right uh, bracket and right parentheses. Now I don't expect that code on lines 12 and 13 to make sense. Again, I'm using it to demonstrate why extracting every third character from a string might be useful. As you work through the course, you'll learn what this code's doing and you'll be able to write code like that for yourself. Now if you're typing the code in as you watch, you may want to copy and paste those two lines from the transcript for this video. The source code is also available in the resources for this video if you want to do that. It's very important that you use the correct type of brackets. The second one you see me use was a square bracket, and obviously I'm using parentheses as there, which some people also call brackets as well. So basically make sure you've typed it in exactly as you can see it here in order for it to work. Now if we run this program, and you can see the output is now showing us the seven values that we've extracted from the string that uh, we bound to the number variable on line eight. I think that's pretty impressive when you consider it's only a few lines of code there, and I'll just bring that back on the screen so you can see it. It's very hard to come up with real world examples when all we've covered so far in the course are variables, ints and strings, but hopefully that demonstration has put the slice into a useful context. So make sure though you understand how that to slice on line nine is working and then I'll see you in the next video. And in that video, we're going to look at slicing backwards. See you in the next video. We've seen that you can use negative start and stop values in a slice. You can also use a negative step. There's only one thing to watch out for, and it's one of those things that's obvious once it's been pointed out. If I asked you to count backwards from 99 and stop when you reach 100, how would you get on? You tell me it's impossible, of course, and you can't possibly get to 100 by counting backwards from 99. Well, neither can Python. Now that you know that, you won't make the most common error that people make when using negative steps in a slice. All right, so let's see some examples. I want to create a new Python file called slice back. Right, so I'm going to start uh, by typing letters. 
equals and the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. Then uh, on line three, I'm going to type backwards equals letters, square brackets, 25 colon zero colon minus one, then the closing right uh, square bracket, and we're going to print backwards. All right, so I've created a slice that starts at index 25, which is the uh, Z, and I've set the stop value to zero and use a step of minus one. So what do you expect the output to be here? So pause the video and have a careful think and come back when you think you've got the answer. All right, so let's uh, run the program now to see if you are right. So we get the letters out of the alphabet in reverse order from Z down to B. Notice that the letter A isn't included. We used a stop value of zero and slices extend up to but not including the stop value. Before I ask you another question, let's review what we've got here on line three. Because we're using a negative step, the start value must be greater than the stop value. Our slice starts at index position 25, and it extends down to index position zero, but doesn't include the character at that position. We're stepping by minus one, which produces all the letters from Z down to B. So my second question is what stop value will let the slice include the letter A? There's two obvious answers to that, but only one of them works. So have a think and run your code to try your answer before starting the video again. So pause the video now. All right, so how did you get on? So one obvious answer, if a slice doesn't include the position at the stop value, is to use a stop value of minus one. But unfortunately, that's the one that doesn't work. So if we try that, and use a stop value of minus one, when we run it, we don't get any output. So you may have worked out why. Remember that negative stop values count backwards from the end of the sequence. Minus one means the last character in the string, which means we've uh, requested a slice that extends from the Z up to, but not including the Z, and therefore we get nothing. The other obvious answer is to omit the stop value. Python will default to the start or end of the sequence if we don't specify start or stop values. So it's clever enough to work out that it should reverse the defaults when we're using a negative step. So if I change that now, get rid of the uh, minus one for our stop, run this, and you can see that the code works. With a negative step, the start value will default to the end of the string, and the stop value defaults to the start of the string. That means we can omit our stop value as well. So we can go back and do that. If we run it now, once again we get the string reversed. A slice of colon colon minus one is a Python idiom. When you see that, you'll recognize it as reversing the sequence. I'll cover a few more uh, slicing idioms in the next video. There's not much else that I can say about slicing backwards. Just use a negative step and make sure the start value is greater than the stop value. Experiment with different values and make sure you're comfortable with what a negative step produces. I'll finish this video with a challenge and go over the solution to that challenge in the next video. So using the letter strings from the video, add some code to create the following slices. Firstly, create a slice that produces the characters Q, P, O. Secondly, slice the string to produce E, D, C, B, A. And thirdly, slice the string to produce the last eight characters in reverse order. So that's your challenge. Have a go at that. And uh, as mentioned, I'll go through the solution to it in the next video. All right, so how did you get on with the challenge from the last video? The first part of the challenge was to slice the string to produce the letters Q, P, and zero. So let's have a go at doing that. So I'm going to type on line seven, print parentheses, letters, square brackets, 16, colon 13, colon minus one. So we're starting at position 16. We're extending backwards up to, but not including the character at position 13. So let's run that. And there's the letters Q, P, and O. So next we want a slice to produce the letters E, D, B, C, A. The easiest way to include the beginning of the string is to omit the stop value. So we'll do that uh, on line 10. So I'm going to type print 
parentheses, letters, square brackets, 4, colon, colon, minus 1. So if we run that, and there's the letters E, D, C, B, A. So finally, we wanted the last eight characters in reverse order. So we'll be using a negative step value, which means the start will default to the end of the string and can therefore be omitted. So to uh, type that, I'm going to do a print parentheses, letters, square brackets, colon, minus 9, colon, minus 1. All right, so running that. And there's the last eight letters, Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, S. Now, there are other solutions you could have used, especially when returning items from the beginning and end of the sequence. Using default values for the start and stop is recommended when trying to return a certain number of characters from the beginning or end of a sequence. If you manage to produce the correct strings with your slices, well done. All right, so I'll finish talking about slices for now by looking at some common idioms that Python programmers use and recognize. In the last video, I mentioned that a slice of colon, colon, minus one is a Python idiom. When you see that, you'll recognize it as reversing the sequence. So let's see some more idioms. So the first is to return the last n items in a sequence. So let's say we wanted the last four characters from letters. So I'm going to come down on line 15. I'm going to type print parentheses letters square brackets minus four colon so if i run that we should get the last four letters w x y z whenever you see a slice with a negative start value and defaults for the stop and step that just returns the end of the sequence a common use of that is to get the last item by specifying minus one for the start value so let's have a go at doing that. So I'm going to type print parentheses and letters square brackets minus one colon. Run that. We get the last item in this case, the Z. Now you can also use a slice to get the first character. Very similar. We just type print parentheses letters square brackets one colon run that and I actually did that the wrong way because that obviously gave us everything but the first starting at sequence position one it should have been colon one which is what I meant to type running that we now get the letter A which is the first item in the sequence the first character now that last one is useful because it doesn't give an error if the sequence is empty it may though be more natural to get the item at index position zero and that works with this string. So we could also do it as print parentheses, letters, square brackets, zero. And that's the same, gives us the same result. That works, but what would happen if our string was empty? So I'm gonna go up and delete the uh, letters, or the characters rather, on line one. So I'll make that uh, an empty string. Run the program. And we now get an error, and the error is that string index out of range. You can't access the first item of the sequence that doesn't contain any items. So looking at the code, the slice on line 17 produces an empty string instead of crashing with an index error. And just to confirm if I run it again, the error is actually talking uh, or is showing on line 18, as you can see there. So I had no problems with executing line 17. So the idiom on line 17 is useful for getting the first item in a sequence without your code crashing. If the sequence is empty, you'll get an empty sequence back, and that's often what you'd want to happen. All right, so that's the end of slices for now. In the next video, we'll look at string operators. See you in the next video. In this video, we'll look at three operators that apply to strings. In fact, they apply to any sequence type. So Python 3 has five sequence types built in. We've got the string type, list, tuple, range, bytes and byte array, which I'm treating sort of as one sequence type. So with that said, what is a sequence? Well, a sequence is defined as an ordered set of items. 
For example, the string Hello World contains 11 items and each item is a character. But a list is also a sequence type. For example, here's a Python list of things you might need when buying a computer. You can see that uh, each item is in double quotes separated by a comma and uh, it's all then in left and right square brackets. So that list contains five items, each of which is a string. And we'll be looking at lists in a later section of this course. So that last example was a list of strings. In other words, it's a sequence where each item is also a sequence. Make sure you fully understand the videos on indexing because indexing is very important when dealing with sequences. Because the sequence is ordered, we can use indexes to access individual items in the sequence. For example, if we have for this example here with computer parts defining a list, then computer parts, left and right square brackets one, will be the string monitor, which is the second entry in the list. But that's also a sequence, and we can index into that sequence as well by using uh, square brackets one to uh, ac get access to monitor, and then square brackets zero would be the letter M in lowercase, which is the first part of that sequence. So we've been looking at strings in this section, but everything that you can do with the STR sequence type can also be done with the other sequence types. Well, everything with one exception. Not all sequence types can be concatenated or multiplied. Range is an example of a sequence that can't be concatenated. All right, so back to the code, I'm gonna create a new Python file called sequence operators. So we've already seen the plus operator used with strings to concatenate them. So let's just type in a few strings. So I'm going to start with typing string one equals he's with a, with a single quote there, but the, the string in double quotes. String two equals probably in double quotes with a space after the y. String three equals pining with a space at the end of uh, the letter g. String four is equal to for the space and double quote there and then string five equals double quotes wards and they're going to print on line seven string one plus string two plus string three whoops i've got a space there string three plus string four plus string five but the plus isn't necessary when concatenating string literals though in uh, Python. So we could also do print, this is on line nine, double quotes, he's, space, then another space outside the double quotes, probably, space there, another closing off double quote, another set of double quotes, but after a space there to separate it, pointing, space, whoops, space outside of the double quote for the, and space, space and forwards. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly. All right. So that'll print the same thing. And if we run this, we should see both outputting the identical output. And obviously I made a typo. Run it again. And we've got the identical output in both cases. So I mentioned this second way because it's how Python works, not because we think you'd ever want to do something like that. I'm sure we'd agree that the first example on line seven is a bit easy to read. Now with that said, strings can also be multiplied, which is a bit weird if you're coming from another programming language. So I can come down on line 11, I can type print parentheses, hello in double quotes with a space before the closing double quote. And I'm gonna put multiplied by five. Now you can't actually perform arithmetic uh, multiplication on strings, of course. Instead, what happens is the star or multiplication operator repeats the sequence a certain number of times, five in this case. So if we run the uh, code, you can see we've got the word hello printed or outputted five times. Now lists and tuples can also be multiplied as we'll see when we look at those sequence types later in the course. You can't concatenate or multiply a range though. And that's not a problem because you probably wouldn't want to do that anyway. Now once again, operator precedence applies. So if I type some other code here, I'll type print parentheses, double quotes, hello, 
space before the closing double quote multiply by 5 plus 4 so this example wouldn't print hello nine times again we're talking about operator precedence there so we run this program we'll see that we'll get an error and the reason we're getting error is because hello in double quotes multiplied by 5 evaluates to a string and then there's an attempt to then add the numeric number 4 to it and it fails for that reason so what we can do is I'm going to show you two things here and they're going to, they actually do different things. So firstly I'm going to change line 13 to put 5 plus 4 in parentheses but then also I can type on line 14 print parentheses double quotes hello space again and multiply by 5 plus and 4 in double quotes. Now because of the parentheses line 13 evaluates 5 plus 4 to get 9 so it should then repeat the string 9 times. Line 14 should repeat the string five times and then append the string four to it. So let's just run that and confirm that's how it works. And you can see that works as uh, I mentioned. Right, so there's also an operator to check if one string is a substring of another. To do that, we actually check if one thing is in another. So let's start by typing some code. Line 16, I'm going to type today equals Friday. And that's in double quotes because it's a string. Okay, next I'm going to type print, parentheses, double quotes, day, in, today. I can put a comment here for each, which should be true. Print, FRI, in today. And obviously the first part's in double quotes, as you can see there. That should also be true. Third example, print, parentheses, and we'll put THUR, in today, which should obviously be false. And lastly, we do a print parentheses parrot double quotes in double quotes fjord. That should also be false. I'll just clean up these a little bit. So here the in operator evaluates to true if the first thing exists in the second and false otherwise. We'll be using that a lot when we look at conditions and for loops and you'll get plenty of practice using it and see loads of real examples. So I'm not going to discuss it any further now but we'll just run that to confirm we're getting the results that uh, we think we should. You can see we get true, true, false, false which goes in line with the code from line 17 to 20 and getting the expected values. Alright so let's end the video here and in the next one we're going to look at the various ways we can format strings and some of the string methods that allow us to manipulate them. See you in the next video. When printing strings and numbers, it would often be convenient to display both values using a single call to print. For example, we may want to print a description of what a value is before the value itself. So we've seen that numbers can't be concatenated with strings using the plus operator as the presence of a number instructs Python to attempt addition and that fails. One approach we could take is to coerce our numbers into a string using the str function. In Python, every data type can be coerced into a string representation. I mentioned that Java did this automatically when an attempt's made to concatenate a string and a number and the same thing's possible in Python. So let's just swing over to the code and create uh, a new file. I'm going to call this one rep fields. Right, so I'm going to start by typing age equals 24. Then a line term, we're going to do print parentheses, double quotes, my age is space double quote plus str age in parentheses plus double quotes space is. Closing double quote and write parentheses. So if we run the program, we confirm we get the output. My age is 24 years and no longer getting an error now when we're using the plus operator to concatenate numbers and strings. So using the string function helps us to uh, basically uh, coerce an integer into a string. But this can rapidly become tedious having to coerce every variable using the string function. Python 3 provides a much better mechanism and uh, that has improved further in Python 3.6. So Python 3 allows strings to be formatted using replacement fields and the dot .format method. And uh, these are probably best explained with a few examples. 
So let's change line two. Instead of using uh, the string function, I'm going to put my age is, and I'm going to put uh, left or right curly braces before the closing double quote with a zero in between them. So my age is space left or right curly braces, zero between that and the space years. And I'm going to delete all the code up until the right parentheses and replace that outside the double quote with dot format age in parentheses. So this will produce the same output as the previous example, but without having to coerce the number into a string. So let's just run this to confirm that it works. Get the same output, my age is 24 years. So the replacement field is represented by the left curly brace, the zero and the right curly brace, which is then replaced by the first value in the format list, age in this case. And at the moment we've only got the one value in there and that's the variable age. So that doesn't look like much of an improvement over the previous code, but consider this one instead. So I'm going to type it out. Line four, I'm going to type print parentheses and double quotes, there are, and we'll add some replacement fields. So first one I'm going to do is a zero, in all of these in curly braces. There are zero days in, then curly brace again, one, with curly braces, comma, and we'll do the same for two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Two, three, four, five, and I'm putting, you can see I'm putting commas and putting curly braces around these numbers again, six. And we'll finish off the last one, we'll put and, replacement field seven. So I'm gonna do that, then press enter there, and the next line type dot format, another set of parentheses. And I'm going to type 31 comma, in the left parentheses, or after the left parentheses, Jan, March, or my arm, the abbreviations I'm going to use here, May, oops, missed a double quote there, July, August, October, and last one, December. And a closing parentheses. So I've split that code over two lines, which is something you'll see done a lot in Python. Long lines are actually frowned upon in the Python style guide, which we'll talk more about later. For now, just know that Python allows you to split your lines of code like I've just done. All right, so the replacement fields are replaced by the values that appear in the dot .format method call with the first value replacing zero, the second replacing one and so on. So you can see there we've actually got a total of seven replacement fields defined on line four, and each of those values are going to go into the respective number, zero through seven. So we've got a total of eight items in the list after the dot format, and each of those will go into the replacement fields numbered zero through seven in our string. So if we run the program now, And comparing the output at the bottom of the screen with the uh, values that appear inside the parentheses after the dot .format method call. So in our code, we used eight replacement fields numbered from zero through seven. These are replaced with the values in the parentheses after the uh, dot .format. So the first value goes into the replacement field zero, which again is defined with a left curly brace, a number, and a right curly brace. So the first value goes into zero, replacement field zero, the second into one, and so on. And that produces the output that we saw when we ran the program. There were 31 days in January, March, May, July, August, October, and December. Of course, you probably wouldn't use string literals inside format, because of course they can just be included in the string. So we could have, uh, in this case, replaced what we did there with something that's probably a lot more readable, print. There are, replacement field zero, days in, in Jan, March, May, July, August, October, and December, and dot format. So that does exactly the same thing, but I just wanted to demonstrate that you can have multiple replacement fields inside a string. And we'll just run that to confirm. I probably should have written it like that. And to be consistent, run it again. We've got the identical output.
The other thing to keep in mind is that fields can be used more than once and they don't have to appear in the order that the values are provided to the dot .format method call. It's the field index, the number inside the curly braces, that determines which value to be used. So here's an example to demonstrate that. So I'm going to come down here on the line 8, print, parentheses, I'm going to start with a double quote Jan, colon, I'm going to start with replacement field 2, then Feb, colon, 0, replacement field, March, colon, we're going to use 2 again, April, colon, we have replacement field 1, May, colon, 2, June, colon, 1, placement field 1, July, colon, placement field 2, September, 1, and October, colon, 2, placement field 2, 2 more, November, colon, placement field 1, comma, December, colon, placement field 2. And obviously I've got a large font here so we're not going to be able to see the entire contents on that line, on this uh, one line. So what I'm going to do is actually go to the end there, just enter there, dot format, and I'm going to put three values, 28, 30 and 31. So if we run the program, and you can see now that the, wherever there's a uh, replacement field 0, it's replaced with the first value in the list, 28. We've only got uh, replacement field 0 once for February, and all the replacement field 1 fields are replaced with the second value, which is 30, and the third value, 31, is used to replace all the uh, replacement field 2 replacement fields. Now you can also use triple quotes. What I'll do is I'll print a blank line first. We'll close this run window down. We'll just print an empty line. And we can also do something similar using triple quotes. So I could do print parentheses, three quotes, triple quotes in other words, press enter there, and what I'm going to do is take a copy of this entire line, just to save me typing it again. Okay, take a copy of that, and I'm going to go back and paste it after the triple quotes. Then what I'm going to do is just press enter after each one to make it a bit more readable. And because I'm pressing enter on a separate line now, I'm also going to remove the double quotes, I remove the comma rather. So I've got February, March, and that's the end of the line there, so I'm going to add the three closing uh, double quotes there, and I'm just going to put our format statement after that, dot format, parentheses, 28, comma 30, comma 31, like so. So now if we run that, looking at the output for this program, each month is appearing on a new line and the number of days is also showing on there as well. So that I'm sure you'd agree would be very difficult or would be very messy to reproduce with string concatenation. So the actual replacement is pretty easy to work out. So replacement field 0 is replaced with 28. And you can see the example there showing us on line 14. So it's automatically coerced to be a string for us. Replacement field 1 is replaced by 30. We've defined that as the second uh, entry in our format list there. And replacement field 2 is replaced by 31. You can see obviously the same use of the replacement fields in the code and we can see the output showing down the bottom of the screen. Now if we'd used replacement field 3 in the string, then we'd have to produce or provide rather another value in the dot .format method call. Right, so make sure you understand how the replacement fields are being used before moving on to the next video. So string replacement fields can also contain formatting to display values with a specific number of decimal places, for example. So let's create a new Python file. I'm going to call it formatting. And uh, I'm going to use a for loop to generate some output. We'll be looking at for loops in the next section, so don't worry about what's happening. Concentrate on the print lines that I'm going to type in this code to see the effect of the formatting in the replacement fields. So we're going to start by printing the values from 1 to 12 with the values of their squares and cubes. 
So on line one, I'm going to type 4i in range, parentheses, 1, 13, and put a colon to the right of the uh, right parentheses. So on line two, I'm going to press enter here. You need to make sure there's four spaces before print, which I'm about to type on line two. I'm going to type print, parentheses, then double quotes, I'm going to type number or the abbreviation NO, period. Then I'm going to put uh, replacement field zero, which is our left and right curly braces with a zero in the middle, squared, is, and replacement field one, and cubed is replacement field two. Then I'm going to type dot format, parentheses, i, i. I'm going to use the exponent operator, which is two multiplication signs, two, then i, exponent operator again, three, which is the, to the power, it's basically raising one number to the power of another in Python. All right, so if we run this now, and you can see we've got the values of the number, the value squared, and the value cubed, for each of those numbers. And in case it's not obvious now, you can provide any expressions inside the format parentheses. They don't have to be variables or literal numbers. On line two, we've got I exponent operator two to get the number squared, and I exponent operator three to get the number cubed. And the exponent operator is how you can raise one number to the power of another in Python, so it's the power two operator as well. All right, so that works, but as you can see, the numbers aren't, or the values rather, aren't lined up. So we can fix that in the output, or fix the output by applying some formatting. So firstly, I'm gonna specify field width for each of the replacement fields. So all the values for i are a maximum of two digits, because we're obviously only counting from one to 12 here. So we can use a field width of two for the first replacement field. I'm gonna use a field width of four for the other two fields. So to actually specify width, we come back up to our line two, and uh, we add the width by putting a colon and then the number that we need. So if the first uh, replacement field is zero, I'm gonna put colons two there for a width of two. And for the other two replacement fields, I'm gonna put colon four and colon four again. So if we run the program now, it's now easy to understand because the formatting uh, makes it uh, easier to see at a glance what the values are. All right, so that looks tidier. The values are now lining up nicely. So on line two, we're using uh, zero colon two in our left and right curly braces for the first replacement field. Two is the field width, as I mentioned, and it's separated from the index with a colon. Now everything in that first column prints in a width of two characters. So think of it as reserving two spaces on the screen so that the one digit values still line up with the two digit ones. And you can see that happening there in the output. Now our squares also line up in a field width of four characters. Maybe a width of three would look better there. Have a go at changing that yourself and see what it looks like. Pause the video and uh, I'll make the change when you come back. Okay, so if we only want to use three spaces for the square values, change is obviously easy enough. We come back up to replacement field one, change the four to a three. And if we run it again, well, that looks tidier still now, as you can see, there's now only one space between is and the value on the last three rows. We can also align the values in their field width. To left align the values, we place a less than symbol after the colon. So what I'm gonna do is just to make this easy to see, I'm going to uh, firstly add a, a blank line. Then I'm gonna take a copy of the line, of the two lines there, and we'll just run it again so the original code's there as well. I'm gonna paste that in as it was before. So this time what I'm going to do, again, we're trying to left align the values. So we'll leave a replacement field zero as it is, the first one. For the second one, we're going to put, before the three, I'm gonna put the less than sign there. And for replacement field two, we're going to put a less than there as well. So if we run this, and the values are now left aligned. And if it's not immediately clear to you what's going on there, scroll up the output to compare the two blocks. But if we have a look at uh, the uh, formatting here, notice how it's now left aligned. You go back up to the top, you can see clearly that was right aligned. So the alignment symbols are quite visual. The less than left aligns, the greater than will right align, and the caret symbol, well that centers within the field width. So let's center the last column to see what that looks like. So instead of using the less than there, I'm going to change that by using the caret uh, symbol instead. And if you run this code again, 
you can see the values are now clearly centered compared to the first uh, output which was uh, right justified on the right hand side and this is obviously for the cubed values now keep in mind that we don't get half spacing in a terminal so the result isn't as accurate as centering values in a GUI program but it's available if you want it so for floating point numbers you can specify precision the number of digits after the decimal point for our precision we specify the precision after a decimal point following the width so let's have a go at doing that so I'm going to type some more code in so I'm going to put an empty line in there and the line after or well, actually line 11 I'm going to type print parentheses pi is approximately we're going to put uh, replacement field 0 colon 12 that's which is the precision for a uh, floating point number then dot format parentheses 22 divided by 7 and two right parentheses to close it off and let's take a copy of that line we're going to make some modifications so I need another uh, five lines I'm going to paste that five times all right so line 12 what we're going to do is we're going to put an F after the 12 next line we're going to put 12 dot 50 F line 14 we're going to put 0 colon 52 dot 50 F and the next two I'm going to put 62 dot 50 F and the last line I'm going to put 72 dot 50 F so the first line of output well actually I'll run it first and then we'll talk about it so the first line of output and that's produced from the code on line 12 and I'll see if I can get that on the screen at the same time uh, on line 11 rather well that's the general format and that defaults to printing 15 decimals when we specify a floating point value using the F on line 12 we get the default of six digits after the decimal point now in lines 13 through 16 we're still specifying a floating point format but we also add a precision of 50 and that gives 50 points after the decimal point the third line of output corresponds to line 13 if you think it doesn't look right that's because Python won't truncate a number we can't print a value that's got uh, 50 decimals in a field width of 12 Python decides that precision is more important than field width and ignores the value 12 that we've specified for the width and that's the code on line 13 now the next three lines after that print the same value but in different field widths when we specify width greater than 50 you can see that the effect becomes clear now the maximum precision of a Python floating point number is between 51 and 53 digits there's not much point specifying a precision greater than that now this will be easy to see if I left a line that last line so I'm going to do that and then copy it and increase the precision just to show you what I mean I'm going to do that copy that last line 16 and we're going to change the uh, 72.54f to 72.54f but we're also going to use the left align so we can see the value left align and we put that to the left of the 72 after the colon we run the program now and what I should do is actually left align the previous line as well just so you can see the differences so we'll do that again as well on line 16 we'll run that again and you can see we only get one extra digit in the output we can see that there's four digits there but the remaining digits are just padded with zeros so there's no actual value there all right so I'll finish this video now by mentioning that the field number in replacement fields is optional if they're not specified then Python takes the value from the uh, format method in order so to see what I mean I'm going to take a copy of the code again it's code up here in line 6 I'll take a copy of that again I'm going to paste it down here on line 19 now I'm going to actually remove everything so we're just going to put just a left and right curly brace only for the three replacement fields and actually what I'll do on the third replacement field I'll just put a colon 4 there so we can see that uh, we're still specifying a width if we run this we can see that the third field shows that you can still use a colon to control the layout even if you haven't specified a field number all the values in the final column of output are printing in a field with the four now if you don't provide field numbers you can't use a value more than once nor can you change the order in which values are used now our earlier example with the number of days in the month wouldn't have actually worked without field numbers 
All right, so experiment with different values for the field widths and precisions to see how it affects your output. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Python 3.6 introduced another way of formatting values in a string. These are called f-strings or formatted string literals. Now at the moment I won't be using f-strings in the course. That's because there's no plans to backport them to earlier versions of Python 3. Python 3.4 is still very common and f-strings won't work with that version or earlier versions. But with that said, it is worth being familiar with them. So let's have a quick look. I'm going to use uh, the strings.py file from an earlier video. So I'm going to select that. We're going to work with this file. Now at um, the moment, we've got an error on the last line. I use that to demonstrate that you can't concatenate a string as an int. So let's firstly just check this by running it again, confirming we've still got the error. And you can see we've still got this type error. It can only concatenate strings, not an int to string. So let's fix that using an F string. So all we really need to do to fix that is to put the letter F before is up here. So put an F before the double quote, and that's literally all we need to do. So an F string is defined by putting the letter F before the opening quotes. Now that we've done that, we can use a variable name inside curly braces in a similar way that uh, we've used replacement fields. So what we can do is uh, delete this extra double quote here, Come up and put age there. We can put age in left and right curly braces, like so. And we can remove the other double quote there. So we've got it all in the one string now. So as you can see, it looks very similar to a replacement field. It's a lot cleaner because we don't have to use dot format at the end anymore. So if we run the program, let's do that just to make sure that it works. And you can see we've no longer got an error. And so the output is showing Tim is 24 years old and Tim wishes he was 24 years old. All right, so all the formatting for replacement fields also work with uh, F strings. So for example, I can do some formatting along these lines. So let's just uh, type some code in. So line 24, I'm gonna type print parentheses F double quotes pi is approximately and then in left and right curly braces, noting that the right one's added for us automatically, I can type in an expression, 22 divided by 7 colon 12 dot 50f. Then we've got our double quote and then our right parentheses. Now clearly you can see that I've used an expression rather than a variable name there. So let's just try running that first. And you can see we've got the value showing. Now what we could also do is calculate 22 divided by 7 first and then use a variable. So let's do that. So pi on line 25 is equal to 22 divided by 7. Line 23 will do a print parentheses f double quotes pi is approximately and left and right curly braces. And we'll put this time we'll use the variable. So pi colon 12.50f for formatting. And, sorry for precision, and then we'll run that again, and you can see we've got the identical output. So now that you understand replacement fields, you can change to using F strings instead if you want, but be aware that your code won't run on Python 3 versions earlier than 3.6 if you do use them. In the next video, we'll finish this section with a quick look at yet another way to format strings. See you in the next video. Python 2 had another way of formatting strings called string interpolation. If you're familiar with printf in C, it works very similar to that. It's useful to understand how it works, but it's not recommended that you use it for any Python 3 programs. That's because it's been deprecated and will be removed from the language at some point. With that said, I'm covering it here for two reasons. Firstly, you may end up working on a project that's still using Python 2. Secondly, there's a lot of example code available on the internet, so it's useful for you to understand some of the Python 2 differences, especially when they're as easy to convert as the uh, formatting operator is. So if you want to skip this video and come back to it, uh, if and only if you have to work with Python 2 code. That so what I'm going to do is create a new file. We're going to call that interpolation. Now the Python 2 formatting operator is the percent, and it's followed in the string by letter to indicate how the formatting should work. 
So I'm going to start by typing age equals 24, line 1. Line 2, I'm going to type print, parentheses, double quote, or quotes rather, my age is, and the percent sign, as I mentioned, D years. And closing double quote, space, and percent sign, age. And closing right parentheses. So here the percent D will be replaced by an integer value that's provided after the string following another percent character. So if we run that, just to confirm that it works, there's the output, my age is 24 years. Now if you wanted to inject a float into a string, we'd use percent %f, and then we'd have to provide a string, and to provide a string, we'd use percent %s. Now let's have a look at both of those. Some code. I'm going to start a line before by typing major equals years. Line 5, minor equals months. I'm going to continue typing on line 6, print, double quotes, my age is percent %d space percent %s, comma, percent %d space percent %s. And then our double quote, and then outside of that, I'm going to put in parentheses age, comma, major, comma, 6, comma, minor. And the two closing right parentheses. And we'll continue on with an example using pi again on line 7, print, parentheses, double quotes, pi is approximately percent %f, double quote, and then percent sign again, parentheses, 22 divided by 7. And two right parentheses. And I forgot to put the uh, percent sign, of course, and then we need to do that on line 6. Okay. Right, so starting on line 6, the first percent %d is replaced by the first variable age. Then the first percent %s is replaced by the string variable major. The second percent %d is replaced by the value 6. And the final percent %s is replaced by the string variable minor. Replacement is strictly one value at a time from left to right, with none of the flexibility offered by Python 3's replacement fields. So moving on to line 7, we've used percent %f to represent the floating point result. So if we run this now, and you see we get the relevant results. Alright, so now that we've run that, you can also specify the precision of the number. What I'm going to do is duplicate line 7, then we'll add, some, we'll add the precision as well. And the way we do that, instead of just putting percent %f there, we change the percent, we type 60.50, to specify the precision, and then we run that. And you can see we get the uh, basically a similar result to when we were using a replacement field. So as well as percent %d, percent %s, and percent %f, we can also use percent %x to display numbers in hexadecimal, percent %o for octal, and percent %e for scientific notification, along the lines of 1.23456e plus 09, for example. Now there are more modifiers and conversion types, and these are presented in tables in the Python docs. So I'll just quickly uh, load that up and show you that link. So check this out uh, for more information on this page. Once again, though, I've mentioned uh, these so that you'll understand them when reading code from the internet, and uh, if you end up using Python 2. You shouldn't be using these in Python 3 code. All right, so let's move on to the next video, which is a quick summary of what we've been through in this section. See you in the next video. In this section, we've looked at running a simple Hello World Python program, and then we moved on to talk about variables. We then mentioned the different types of variables that are built into Python before discussing the number data types int and float, and one of the sequence data types, string, or str, which is an abbreviation for string. So we've seen the basic operations that can be performed on numbers and strings, and we looked at operator precedence as well. Indexing a sequence is incredibly useful, and we used the string type to learn how to do that. Next we saw how to use slices to extract substrings, and the string operators plus, multiply, and in. And finally we looked at various ways to format strings, and how to print strings and numbers together. So that's the end of the section. In the next one, we're going to have a look at statements that allow us to control the flow of a program and to repeat parts of a program a number of times. See you in the next section.
Now that we can perform calculations and display the results, it's time to move on to see how we can get Python to make decisions and perform tasks repeatedly. Like many programming languages, Python works in blocks of code. One of the design principles of Python though was that it should be uncluttered and easy to read. Because of this, Python doesn't use delimiters around blocks of code. If you've used other programming languages, you may be used to seeing braces, the select and right curly braces, or begin and end around code. Python doesn't use anything like that, but instead uses indentation to indicate when a new block starts. I've opened the exchange underscore chart program in IntelliJ so that I've got some code to talk about. Now you won't need this file in your project, we're not going to be running it in this section. This is one of the few times in the course when you won't be typing along. So relax, sit back and watch the video as I show you blocks of code in this program. Alright, so let's look at the blocks of code in this program. Firstly, starting on line 66, we've got a for loop. That starts a new code block and we can see that line 67 through to lines 82, which is just off screen, well it's actually on screen but I'll move it up a little bit more, like so. So you can see those lines, 67 to 82, they're all part of that code block, which is the for loop defined on line 66. Now I don't want you to try and understand the code here because most of it probably won't make sense at this point in the course. You should be able to work out that line 67 though is using replacement fields. And I'll just move that over a little bit more so we can see it. And it's using a replacement field to put the year and month at the end of that URL. But most of this code in general will be confusing. And that's fine. What we're interested in though at the moment are the various levels of indentation. So concentrate on the shape of the code and we'll learn what it all means in due course. All right, so we've got a block of code from line 67 through to and including lines 82. We can make it easier to see the blocks by turning off indentation guides. Now most modern IDEs will have a similar feature. In IntelliJ, you go into settings. Now that's preferences if you're using a Mac. In my case, I'm on a Windows machine so and it'll be the same for Linux, File, I'm going to select Settings. Once you then navigate to Editor, then down to General, and then here into Appearance. And you want to make sure that the Show Indent Guides is actually checked. So I'm going to check that now. Click OK. And you can see now that IntelliJ draws guides to show the indentation levels. You can see that slight, uh, really grey, light grey line now in the indentation. So line 67 and line 69 are indented one level. So below that, line 70 is indented another level. Line 72 is also at that second level. And uh, so are all the lines 74 to 79. And you can see there's a third level of indentation on lines 80 through 82. So each level of indentation is a new block of code. So let's see them again. The main code has no indentation and starts up against the left margin. Lines 67 to 82 are all part of another block of code and are indented one level. The convention is to indent four spaces at a time. Within that second block, we have other blocks for lines 70 and 72, and also lines 74 to 82. And finally, there's a fourth block, lines 80 to 82. So that's how we create blocks of code in Python. Now, I haven't explained why you want to do that. At the moment, we're looking at what a code block is. So as you can see, a block of code can contain other blocks. We start a new code block by indenting the code. Now, have you noticed anything else about the lines that start a new code block? Well, lines 66, 69, 71, 73, and 79 all start a new code block. If you examine those lines carefully, Hopefully you can spot something that they all have in common. Did you spot it? Well, all those lines end in a colon. Whenever a line ends with a colon, Python will expect a new code block to follow it. That means that the next line must be indented. When you've finished all the code for a block, you remove the indentation for the next line. The blocks of code on lines 67 to 82 finish with line 82 because the indentation for the next line is removed and uh, you can see that line 84 right towards the bottom of the screen isn't indented. Line 72 is a code block containing only one line, line 73 is indented back one level. There's another code block a bit further down, I'm going to scroll that so you can see it and it's the, the block of code on lines 87 to 88, you can see those there. 
only those two lines are indented, which means only those two lines are part of the for loop. Once again, don't worry about the code, just concentrate on how indentation is used to create a new code block. We're learning why in the rest of this section. All right, so that's the end of the demonstration and what code blocks are. Next, we'll see how to create them. So I've created a new project for this section and I've called the project Program Flow, which probably isn't very imaginative. You may want to call your project something else like Flow Control or Program Flow or something of that nature or something that makes sense. So I'm going to close this file now because we are done with it for now. And close it down. So what I'm going to do is click on my project to open it. I'm going to right click it, select new, Python file, and let's go with the name Blocks. Right, and I'll just close down the uh, project pane to make a bit of space. Now we're going to start with some code that we've seen before. It still won't make sense, but uh, we'll let us see how to create a code block. So I'm going to type on the first line for I in range parentheses 1 comma 13 right parentheses and a colon. Now when I type that colon, IntelliJ ID is showing an error. If I hover the mouse over it, you can see a description that says indent expected. So if I then press enter here, you see that the error has now moved to the next line. And that can be very confusing. You've hardly typed anything and you've already got an error. Don't worry, you will sometimes get things like this until you finish typing the code. IntelliJ is trying to make sense of code that isn't finished yet and it gets a bit confused. And most IDEs will do the same thing if they provide syntax checking while you type like IntelliJ is doing. Helpfully though, IntelliJ has automatically indented that new line when I pressed enter. So when I start typing print, you can see there that it was already indented for us. I'm going to finish this line, print, left parentheses, double quotes, no, we'll put number or NO for short, period, then left to right curly braces, squared, is, and left to right curly braces again, and cubed, is, and we're going to left to right curly braces again, but within those we're going to put colon 4, we have talked about this in the previous section, finishing off the uh, double quote, put dot format, Parentheses i comma i star star two comma i star star three and two right parentheses to finish the line. Note that that's now cleared the error and notice also that the cursor is automatically positioned when I press enter now at the same level of indentation. Now if we wanted more code inside the loop, we just keep typing. There's only one line I want in this block, so we're going to use the backspace key now to delete the indentation. And you can see just one backspace went right back to the start. Now if you want to indent again, press the tab key. Notice that the IDE adds four spaces and removes four spaces when I use backspace again. So it knows in other words that we're in a code block and automatically adds the correct number of spaces for us. Now you can also select a line of code and use shift tab to remove a level of indentation. Do you see what I mean? I'm going up to line two. I'm going to hold down shift and press tab. I can indent it again with tab, shift tab to uh, remove the indentation and tab again to add it. All right, so moving on to the next line now. Line three, I'm going to type print parentheses, double quotes, I put an asterisk in the double quotes, then multiplied by 80, right parentheses, now if I run this program, we can see we get squares and cubes printed followed by a line of asterisks. So the block of code inside that for loop executes 12 times but we only get a single line of asterisks at the end and that's because line 3 isn't part of the block. However we can make it part of the block by tabbing it across. So we'll come over here on line 3 and tab it over. So it's now indented at the same line or same level as line two. If we run the program again, notice that we get a very different result this time. The output's very different, as you can see there. Both lines are now part of the same block and therefore both lines get executed 12 times. All right, so that's how we create a code block using the tab key to indent the code. We're also starting to see why we might want to do that. We get very different results when we include line three in the block compared to having it outside of the block. The code still won't make a lot of sense. What are for and range? Well, that's some of the things we'll be looking at in the rest of this section. 
But now that we understand what code blocks are, we can start to use them in our code. We'll make a start on that when we look at telling Python how to make decisions in the next video. We've seen how we can store values in variables and print them out. We've also looked at getting input from the keyboard in the previous section in this course. We'll now start getting Python to make decisions based on the values of variables and input. And just to quickly recap, I'm going to just type in a quick program. I'm going to delete the last three lines from the uh, last video. I'm going to type name equals input, parentheses, and double quotes. Please enter your name colon and a space there and on line 2 age equals input parentheses double quotes again how old are you comma space then we want a left and right curly braces replacement fields at zero in the middle question mark to the right of the right curly brace and a space now closing double quote dot format name and two right parentheses the line 3 we're going to print out the value of age so print parentheses age. All right, just as a quick recap to what we've done previously, I'm going to run that code now. And remember to click into the run window as I did before typing your name if you're using an IDE like IntelliJ. So I come down here and click on that. And I'll just move this down a little bit. I'm going to type in my name. Enter. How old are you, Tim? I like to think I'm 21. Press enter. 21 is uh, shown in the window. So note that we can use replacement fields in any string, including the one we're using as a prompt to the input function. The input function returns a str or string data type. We have to convert it to an int if we want age to represent a number rather than the string. And we do that with the int function. So if we change line two slightly, instead of putting input parentheses, we'll put int left parentheses, then right at the end now we've done that, we need to go to the end of the line and add a right parentheses there to keep Python happy. So using int and input together like this is very common when you want to get a number from the user. It does have a serious problem though. Your code will crash if you type anything that can't be converted to an integer. Now we'll be looking at how to handle that later in the course. Until then, make sure you only enter valid numbers when our programs expect a number. All right, so if we just run this to confirm. Enter your name again, Tim. 25. We're getting the value of 25. And let's just quickly show what would happen if we do insist on typing something that's not a number. If I type in the text 20, you can see we've got an error there. And again, we'll talk about how to fix that later in the course. All right, at this point though, we've got a number. We saw that that was working. And we can make, uh, at this point, some decisions based on the person's age. So let's start by checking if they're old enough to vote. In many countries, including Australia, the legal age for voting is 18. Let's come up uh, and on line five, type if space age is greater than in the equal sign 18 colon, press enter. So we started with the keyword if and followed it with a condition. And here the condition is age greater than equal to 18. Now notice the colon that I placed on the end of that line. That means we're about to start a new code block. In fact, we did start a new code block when I pressed enter. And the IDE indented the next line for us automatically, as we've seen previously. The indentation is very important. That's how Python knows that we're starting a new block of code. All right, so if they're old enough to vote, we'll print out a suitable message. So let's do that on line six. We'll put print, parentheses, double quotes. You're old enough to vote. Okay. So if the condition is true, in other words, the age entered is greater than or equal to 18, then we're printing out the message, you're old enough to vote. And I'll just press backspace there to remove the indentation. Let's run it. And we'll do it a few times just to make sure with different ages that it is working as expected. So if I start by typing eight uh, on my name firstly, then the age is 18, you're old enough to vote. So that's working. Tim and I'll try 17. We get just the value 17. We don't get a message saying we're old enough to vote. And lastly, we'll do one 50. Tim, 50. You're old enough to vote. And again, remember to type valid numbers or you'll get the error that I showed earlier in the video if you're not using a number. All right, so what we've done there in line five, that's how to test a condition in Python. 
keyword if followed by condition, in this case age greater than or equal to 18. And finishing the first and finally ending the line with a colon. Now conditions can be a lot more complex than that as we'll see. We know that a colon tells Python to expect a new code block, so line 6 is indented by 4 spaces. If age is less than 18, nothing happens, which is a bit unfriendly. We can cater for that by adding an else clause to our if keyword. Now we don't want any more code inside the if block, which means we remove the indentation on the else line. So I've already done that, you saw me do that earlier, but we'll start typing on line 7, else, colon, press enter. Notice how IntelliJ has helpfully indented again, we'll type print, parentheses, double quotes, please come back in, and we'll use a replacement field with a zero in between the left and right curly braces, space years, double quote, comma, and we'll put format, parentheses, 18 minus age and the two right closing parentheses. So if the person's age is greater than or equal to 18, the first block of code is executed, otherwise the second one is executed, asking them to come back when they're 18. Or more specifically, in a number of years, asking them to come back when they're 18. So we run a few, I run this a few times just to make sure that it works, let's do that. Tim, 18, still get the same result, 18 year old enough to vote. Tim, 50, you're old enough to vote, that's working. And we'll do one more this time if they're less than 18. Tim, we'll say nine. Please come back in, and we made a typo there. I'll put a comma there, notice I put a comma there instead of a period, which is a subtle little bug. We'll do that. We didn't see that until we entered the value. So Tim, how old are you, nine? And there it is again, please come back in nine years. And that's because I enter the age of nine and the uh, Calculation on line 18 was 18 minus what we entered, in this case 9. So it says come back in 9 years, when of course you'll be 18. Alright, so as we saw in the last video, a block can contain several lines of code to execute. So let's go ahead and add something, a second line, under line 6. So on line 7 I'm going to type print, parentheses, double quotes, please put an X in the box. And we'll close off the uh, string and then write parentheses. Because line 6 and 7 are in the same block, in other words they're indented to the same level, we should find that both messages will be printed if the age is greater than or equal to 18. So let's just run that to confirm that is the case. You enter your name, Tim, 19, you're old enough to vote, please put an X in the box. There's often several ways to do the same thing when programming. It may seem natural to deal with the voters first, but we can do that the uh, other way around as well. So to see what I mean, I'm going to add some code. And we'll add that uh, down here. On, we'll start on uh, line 11, we'll leave line 10 blank. We're going to put if age is less than 18, colon, and let's just copy the line. Here we'll copy that line. Notice when you move the cursor down, it automatically moved over to the indentation level. I'm going to paste that as if the age is less than 18. Else, colon, I'm going to grab the two lines up here. I'm going to paste those in as well. Notice that uh, IntelliJ helpfully indents at the right line, or to the uh, right uh, indentation level. And again, we're doing things the other way around. We're not dealing with the voters first this time. We're dealing with people who in fact aren't old enough to vote first, and the people who are second, just to show you there's another way of doing the same thing. So we run this, and we're going to enter the same thing twice now. So Tim, 15, please come back in three years as you can see. We've got exactly the same output two times, and that's because we've got two conditions in there, two code blocks if you will. So if I enter that again, Tim, 21, and you can see we've got the output again duplicated. because effectively we've duplicated, we've got two ifs code blocks with the appropriate else clauses entered. So the code ultimately that I've added does exactly the same thing, but it's checking the condition the other way around. If the person is less than 18, we print the message asking them to come back, otherwise we print the two lines asking them to tick the box. So it doesn't matter which way around you phrase the conditions? Well in this example, no it doesn't, but in the next video, we'll see why it can matter. See you in the next video.
Sometimes we need to check more than just two cases. So looking at the code from the last video, we're testing to see if age is greater than or equal to 18 on line 5, and we test the opposite condition, age less than 18, on line 11. In both cases, the condition can be either true or false. If it's true, the code blocks on line 6 and 7 and line 12 are executed. If the condition evaluates to false, the code in the else block executes. Python lets us test several conditions by using elif. So I'll explain a couple of rules about elif in a moment. Firstly, though, let's see an example of using it. What I'm going to do is add another condition to the second if statement. So I'm going to come down here to line 12. After line 12, I'm going to do a backspace there. I'm going to type elif space age is equal to, that's two equal signs, 900 colon. And on the uh, indented line, I'm going to type print, in parentheses, double quotes, sorry Yoda, you die in Return of the Jedi. And I've left the final else on line 15. So elif, if you haven't guessed it, is short for else if. The code now checks to see if age is less than 18. If it is, the message on line 12 will be printed. If age isn't less than 18, Python checks the elif condition on line 13. So that'll evaluate to either true or false. If true, we let Yoda know of his demise. We're assuming that anyone who's 900 years old must be Yoda from Star Wars. And if I've just spoiled that movie for you, I do apologise. But moving on, if the age doesn't equal 900, the condition evaluates to false, and Python continues with the else on line 15. Now before I run the program, what I'm going to do is comment out the first if statement on lines 5 through 9. And instead of having to manually go through each line, most IDEs do have a quick way of doing that. So in IntelliJ, I can just select the lines I want to comment out. On my Windows, I can do a control forward slash. And it's a command forward slash if you're on a Mac. And the control slash will also work on uh, Linux. Right, so that's commented out and now won't execute. So let's run the program. First, I'm going to enter Tim as my name again, which I've been doing. So next, we have to enter an age. We've got a few tests to perform, starting with the value less than 18. So let's try that. I'll do 11. And I'll just put the code on screen there so we can see that. So you can see that's less than 18 that I entered, 11. And the code on line 12 was executed. And we got that output. And that's because the condition on line 11 evaluated to were true. And just to be consistent, let's check what happens when I enter an age of exactly 18. Tim and 18. 18, you're old enough to vote. Please put an X in the box. This time the condition on line 11 evaluated to false. Python then checks the elif condition, the else if, on line 13. This also evaluates to false, and therefore line 14 didn't get executed. Instead, Python skipped to the else block. There's no more conditions to check, and none of the ones that were checked were true, so we're left with the else. Lines 16 and 17 were executed, and we get that message that you're old enough to vote, and to put an X in the box. And just to confirm, if we run this again, if I enter an age that's uh, greater than 18, we should see the same result. So I'll put, uh, say, 45. Same result as we just talked about when I entered uh, 18. All right, so final test now is to enter 900 to see whether that works. And you can see there, 900, sorry Yoda, you die in Return of the Jedi. So we're getting that message, and that's because the elif, else if, for age is equal to 900, evaluates to true, and line 14 was executed. So all that would be much easier to understand if we could see the computer executing the code line by line. Well, as it happens, we can do that. In the next couple of videos, we're going to have a look at the debugger that's built into the IntelliJ IDEs. We're going to look at the IntelliJ PyCharm debugger in the next video. In the video after that, we'll see how to do the same thing with a debugger that's built into Idle. Now, if you're using a different IDE, it probably has a debugger as well. But uh, please don't ask us how to use it. There's literally hundreds of IDEs, and we've chosen to use the JetBrains products for this course. If you use something else, then that's either because you know how to use it, or there's someone in your company who does know. We can't unfortunately provide support for other IDEs. But if it's IntelliJ support you're after, we're quite happy to help you with that. So let's move on now, and I'll see you in the next video. In this video, we'll see how the debugger 
built into IntelliJ and PyCharm can help us to understand what our code's doing. We've seen how to run the code by right clicking in the editor pane, like so, and selecting run, but just below that there's this debug option. Now just before I click that, I want to talk about an option that might come up on the screen like you'll see here for Windows users. So if you see this dialog and you're on Windows, either now or at some other point when using your IDE, then it's very important that you tick the box to allow access on private networks as you can see checked on the screen. Make sure that's checked and then click on allow access. Failing to do that, you'll find that uh, basically IntelliJ or your IDE, whatever you're using, won't be able to access the internet. Now on a Mac, although I haven't got a screenshot for this, you may notice there's a little message that can appear down the bottom right hand corner suggesting you install a Cython extension. Now if you're using a different implementation of Python other than what uh, we've suggested you install in this course, you won't see that. But with the C Python implementation on a Mac, you should see a pop up uh, at some point. But I suggest you ignore it, and if you do that, the dialogue will disappear after a short while. Now this particular extension on a Mac, it can be really useful if you've got a large code base, but uh, at the moment, the code in this course isn't complex enough to benefit from installing another extension. It's really just introducing another potential point of failure. So for that reason, I suggest uh, you ignore it. Right, so back to the screen now. I'm gonna click on debug instead of run. Now you can see what's happened there. We've got uh, some text showing PyDev debugger process 4672 is connecting. It may well say connected instead of connecting. Now ignore the process ID, that number will probably be different for you and in fact will be different every time you're running it. Now notice that we've got a debug pane at the bottom of the screen rather than a run pane and that will come up when we're actually using this debugger. Now the, the debugger itself has got two panes, we've got the debugger and the console and you can see at the moment the console pane is checked and that just shows the output from your program just like it did uh, when we were running programs previously. It's basically the same output uh, if you're running it using the run option. And we'll see the debugger tab in a moment. But what I'm gonna do now is just enter my details. Down here I'm going to type in my name and an age. And you can see the program runs just as it did before in the previous video. But where the debugger gets interesting is when we set breakpoints in our code. A breakpoint tells the debugger to pause at that point. This allows us to see what the code's doing and step through line by line. The good news is that setting a breakpoint's easy. All you need to do is just uh, click in the left margin on the line you want to set the breakpoint at. So I'm going to set one over here on line 11, clicking in the margin there. And you can see when I did that, the line's highlighted and we've got now a red dot in the left margin. To clear a breakpoint, click it again. And you can toggle breakpoints on and off throughout your code. I'm going to set that one back on line 11. Now that I've done that, I want to use the debug option again. The code will stop when it reaches that breakpoint. Now to get there, because we're executing the code at the moment above that, we're executing the code at the moment on line one, so we need to enter some information until the code gets to that point. So I'm going to type in Tim and 30. And you can see what happened when I press 30 there, the program's now got up to line 11, and it's waiting there for us to do something. Now in the debugger tab of the debug pane, you can see the value of our two variables there on the right hand side. Now the debugger tab normally opens automatically as you saw that it did here in my case, but you can switch between the debugger and the console tabs by clicking them. So I come over here and click on console and there's the output. I'll go back to debugger for now. So looking at the uh, left hand pane in the debugger tab, it can look a tad confusing. The good news is we can ignore all of that at the moment. Just make sure that you've got the top option blocks selected and you can see at the top that it is selected for me. Now to the right of the console tab, note that we've got a mini toolbar with a few buttons. The first one, the three horizontal bars that represent lines of code, shows the current line that will be executed. Now where that is useful is in larger programs or programs using several files. We've only got a few lines of code but we can demonstrate what it does. And I can do that by going back up to line one, say to uh, there. If our current execution line was off the screen, say, this button's a quick way to get back to it. So I'm going to come down here and click on that button. You can see the cursor split down to line 11. Not particularly useful in a small file, but very much useful if you've got larger files or multiple files that you're working on. Now I'm going to talk about the last button next, this one over here. It's the last one that's available anyway. And you can see that it looks a little bit like a calculator, and it lets you evaluate expressions. 
Now our code is about to execute line 11 and hasn't executed it yet. I'm just gonna move that code down so you can see a bit more of it. And then I'm gonna click on that little button, evaluate expressions. Now I'm gonna move this over to the right so we can still see the code and see this at the same time. And under expression, I'm going to type age less than 18. I come down here, click on evaluate. And when I do that, note that we've got result equals and in left to right curly braces, bool being the type and then the value in this case, false. So looking at our code, we can see now that uh, given that age less than 18 is false, that line 12 won't be executed. That's because the expression on line 11 is going to evaluate to false. I suggest you do this when using the debugger as a learning tool. Don't just click the next button and watch the code executing. Take the time to read the code and work out what it's going to do. When you think you've worked it out, then you can step through the code to see if you're right. Great way to learning, really solidify the information you're learning in this course. Now, if you just mindlessly click the button to run the next line, which I'll talk about shortly, you won't really learn very much. You'll learn how to mindlessly click a button, but we're learning to become programmers here, not mindless button clickers. All right, so moving forward, we know that line 12 won't be executed. Next comes line 13. So that's gonna test the condition age is equal to the value of 900. Now we really don't need the expression evaluated to work that one out because we can clearly see age in the uh, debugger variables pane there at the bottom of the screen showing the value of 30. But we're seeing how to use it. So I'm gonna enter the expression anyway. Age equals equals 900. Note also if I type a variable name that doesn't exist, will actually get an error. So it's a good way to confirm that uh, what you're typing is valid. So age is equal to equal is equal to 900. I was typing 1800 instead of 900. Same deal there, I can click on evaluate. And you can see the result down the bottom, again, is showing false. And just to confirm that I could change this, result is equal to 30, evaluate. You can see the value there is true. So I can see how this is a very useful tool, but I'll set it back to 900. You can evaluate, we get false again, Basically, that's telling us also that the code on line 14 won't be executed either. All right, so there's no other conditions in our short little program to check, and none of the ones we've checked were true. So the only really thing left now is the else block, so that's what's ultimately going to be executed on line 16. So let's see if we're right. I'm going to firstly close the evaluate uh, pop-up. Let's have a look at some of these other buttons here to the right of that uh, this little button here that we've already talked about, the show execution point. Now the two buttons we're going to look at at the moment are this one here, which is the step over and step into. We're not really going to look at this other one, step into my code at this point. Specifically, it's uh, these first two, which appear to do the same thing. And we'll actually look at step into when we actually start writing our own functions. For now though, I'm going to come over here and click on step over, noting that we've got a shortcut key we could uh, use instead of clicking if we prefer. So I'm going to click that once. Notice when I do that, the code on screen has jumped to line 13. So line 12 didn't get executed as we expected, and we're at the elif statement on line 13. I'm gonna click the button again and see what happens with this expression. And you can see also we were right again. In this case, line 14 wasn't executed. Instead, we've skipped straight down to the else code on line 16. Basically, we knew that both of those expressions evaluated to false, and uh, got, we've got confirmation of that by clicking on the step over button. Now we can also confirm that nothing's been output by clicking over here to the console tab. So I'll do that now. And notice we've got the uh, two bits of information that I typed in, but we've got no other output at this time. But if I click on step over one more time now, you can see that cause line 16 to execute. We've got the message you're old enough to vote printed in the console. Clicking it one more time, we'll execute the last line and then end the program. And you can see that's what's happened. We've got the message, put an X in the box and the program terminates. All right, so that's the debugger. Now we're gonna be using the debugger a lot in the early sections. I don't recommend using one for real debugging unless you're totally stuck, but they're a great way to watch your code executing while you're learning about it. Experiment with setting breakpoints and stepping through your code to get used to using the debugger. Now, before I finish, there's another button I wanna show you. It's very useful if you do get stuck, if you step too far, for example, or end up debugging the Python libraries. So I'm gonna run the program in the debugger one more time. So notice the red square over to the left hand side of the screen down the bottom. That's used to stop execution, allowing you to start again if you get caught or get into a mess. You might get some errors when you stop the program, but I'm gonna click on that now. 
Now I've only got a note there saying the process finished with exit code minus one, but if you do get some errors when you stop the program, that's fine. Ignore any errors in that scenario, that's completely okay when you're terminating the program, as we've done there by stopping it. So with that said, I'm gonna finish now, and uh, in the next video, what we're going to do is uh, start taking a look at uh, more on if, elif, and else. See you in the next video. So now that we've seen how to use the debugger to step through our code line by line, let's explore if statements a bit more. So I'm going to continue with the project we set up for this section of the course, Program Flow. We're going to create a new Python file. We're going to call that Guessing Game. All right. Now I'm going to start this off very simply, but we'll improve it as we go along. First thing, I'm going to start by binding a variable to the answer. Now the answer will always be five at the moment, and that's a bit boring, but we'll improve the program later. So answer equals five. So next I want to print a prompt to let the user know what they're entering, and then we'll use the input function to get their input. So on line three, I'm going to type print, parentheses, double quotes, please guess a number between one and 10. Put a colon and a space there, then we've got that closing double quote and uh, right parentheses. Then we're going to accept the input by typing guess equals int left parentheses input left to right parentheses and then a closing right parentheses. Now I haven't provided a prompt this time. We're printing a message on line three which tells the player what the program's expecting them to do. Line four uses the input function without a prompt, but we still need the opening and closing parentheses after it as you saw me type. As before, we're using the int function to convert their input to an integer. All input is stored as a string, but here we want to deal with numbers. So on line four, we're actually uh, binding the name guess to the integer value that we've converted to an integer. So make sure you only entered valid numbers when we run the program. We'll be looking at how to cope with invalid input later in the course. All right though, now it's time to see if the player's guess was correct. Now here when we run the program, there's three possible outcomes. The guess could be too low, it could be too high, or they could have guessed it correctly. What we want to do first is test for a too low guess. We'll do that first. And we'll do that on line six by typing if guess is less than answer colon then parentheses, sorry, print then parentheses on line seven, double quotes, please guess higher. Then we've got our closing double quote and right parentheses. So basically if their guess is less than the answer, we print a message asking them to guess higher. Now there's a bit more we need to do here, but we'll come back to that. Before we do though, let's add a test for the guess being too high. Now we can do that using elif. So I'm here on line eight, I'm going to type elif guess. This time we're going to type greater than answer colon. Then we're going to print on line nine, parentheses, double quote, please guess lower. Then we've got our closing double quote and right parentheses. Now you might think that we can just use if there, and you often can, but I'm gonna discuss why that's sometimes not a good idea shortly. All right, so if the condition on line six is false, the condition on line eight is tested. And if that evaluates to true, in other words, if their guess is greater than the answer, then we print the message, please guess lower. So that's two of the three possible outcomes dealt with. We're checking for the guess being less than the answer and for it being greater than the answer so far. If both those conditions are false, then the guess must be equal to the answer. In other words, they've guessed correctly. So therefore we can handle everything else here using else. So I'm gonna type else colon on line 10 and print a message, print parentheses, double quote, you got it first time. Then we've got a closing double quote and write parentheses. So basically the message on line 11 is only going to be printed if both the conditions on line six and line eight evaluate to false. Because else picks up everything else, it must come after the if and elif blocks. Elif must follow an if, and all elif blocks have to appear before the else block if there is one. All right, so let's run the program a few times to check that it's working. I'm gonna run it now. So first I'm gonna enter my guess as four. Remember to click into the run panel as I just did before typing a guess. We get the message, please guess higher, which is correct because obviously four is less than five. I'm gonna run it again. And this time, I'm gonna type a higher value, eight. 
And you can see we've got the output please guess lower, which is also correct. Eight, of course, is uh, more or higher than five. The third test is when the guess is correct. So I'm gonna run that again. And this time I'm gonna type in the value five. And we've got the message, you got it first time on screen. So run the program a few times with different guesses to make sure it works. And in the next video, what we'll do is we'll run the program in the debugger to check what it's doing. See you in the next video. Right, let's talk more about using if, elif, and else in the debugger. At the moment, our program only allows one guess as its answer. Now we're gonna change that in an upcoming video, but first, let's run it in the debugger just to confirm what's happening. I'm gonna set a breakpoint over here on line six. I'm gonna right click and choose debug guessing game. Now if you're using a different IDE, just start your debugger in the usual way. All right, so at the moment, you can see down the bottom of the screen, our program's waiting for our input. So I'm gonna click into here and enter the answer three. That's obviously less than our answer five. Now when I press enter, the debugger stops on line six. That's going to test if guess is less than the answer, which of course it is. We can see the values of guess and answer in the variables pane. Now IntelliJ also shows the values in the code pane. We can see answer five at the end of line one, but also we can see three as the guess entered at the end of line four. So work out in your mind which line's gonna be executed next before using the step over button. So I'm gonna come over and do that. As expected, we get to line seven. Stepping over again, the program's executed. And did you note that the little console tab has got the little uh, yellow circle and a down arrow indicating there was some output. You might've seen that flashing. So we click onto that. We can see we've now got some output below where we entered three, please guess higher, and the program's terminated. So basically Python won't test the code in an elif or an else when the if condition is true. And obviously in this case, guess less than answer was true. It printed please guess high and the program terminated. All right, so now we're about to test the condition guess is greater than answer, which will be true. So let's rerun, or re-debug I should say, by clicking on debug. I'm going to enter eight as my guess. We've stopped on line six again, and this time the condition is going to be false because eight is obviously less than five. So I'm going to step over. Next, we're about to test the condition guess greater than answer, which will be true. So I'm gonna step over again, stepping over one more time. You can see the flashing little down arrow in the console tab at the top there. Click on that and we can see the output, please guess lower. All right, so let's run the program one more time in the debugger this time. We're going to enter the guess as five. All right, so now that we've entered five, so the condition on line six will be false and so will the condition on line eight. Those lines will still get executed. Python has to evaluate the conditions to know what the results will be. It's the code in the blocks after the if and elif that will get skipped. So let's use step over to see the first condition getting evaluated. And then we'll click step over again to evaluate line eight. Execution has jumped to line 11. Note that the else isn't evaluated. There's no condition to evaluate. Else blocks will be executed if nothing else evaluated to true. The rules I mentioned a couple of videos ago are simple. So an if statement begins with the keyword if followed by a condition. The if condition will always be evaluated. Next, you can have one or more elif blocks. You don't have to include elif, and we will be seeing code that doesn't. But if you have any elif lines, then they come after the if. Elif also has to come before else, if there is an else. And finally, you may have an else block. You don't have to use else, but if you do, it must come after the if. And it must also come after any elifs if there are any. All right, so we're back in the code here and I'm going to uh, click on step over one more time. Program's ended, click on the console tab and you can see you've got it first time is outputted to the screen. All right, in the next video, we're going to improve the program slightly. It's still not gonna be very exciting. We've got a few more things to learn first, but we have to learn to walk before we can run. See you in the next video. All right, so let's revise our guessing game. Specifically, what we're going to do is give our players another guess, and we'll do that by requesting input again. So at the moment, we've got the code on line six, which tests whether guess is less than answer. Then we print a message, please guess higher. We're gonna add some code down here on line eight, and we're going to type guess equals int parentheses 
input, left to right parentheses, and then a closing right parentheses. Now it's important that this line is indented at the same level as line seven, and in my case you can see that it is. Both lines are part of the same code block and are indented to the same level. All right, so at this point we've got a second guess from the player. The next step is to see if that guess was correct or not. So we're gonna add some code on line nine now. If guess is equal to answer, so two equal signs there, colon, and on the next line print parentheses, double quotes, well done, you guessed it. And obviously we've got a closing double quote and right parentheses there. So we're comparing guess to answer to see if they got the correct answer. So note that we have to use two equal symbols here, one on line eight and one on line nine. A single equal is used when binding a variable to a value or when assigning a value to a variable, if you prefer to think of it that way. Now when testing for equality, we use two equal signs. Okay, so that's all we need to do. We've used an if statement to check if they got the right answer. I'll leave the code like that because I wanna make it clear that you don't have to have elif and else in your if statements. The code would benefit from an else clause, but we'll come back to that. All right, so that's the second guess when the first guess was lower than the answer. We'll do the same thing if it was higher. So I'm gonna come down specifically to the code here and on line 13, type the same code in. I could copy and paste it, but I'll type it in again. Guess equals int, left parentheses, input, left to right parentheses, and then closing parentheses. If, on the next line, guess is equal to, so two equal signs, answer colon, press enter, print, parentheses, double quotes, all done, you guessed it. All right, so we've done the same when testing whether the guess is greater than the answer as well. And again, very important that uh, you've got the correct indentation there and that the code's indented nicely under the print statement on line 12, which we've done. So our if and elif blocks each contain now another if block. Specifically, that's the blocks on lines nine to 10 and also on lines 14 to 15. The two if statements are indented one level at the same level as the other lines in the same block as you can see. Lines 10 and 15, they're indented another level because they're in another block. Those lines will only be executed when the condition guess is equal to answer is true. All right, so let's see if this works. I'm just gonna run this as opposed to debugging. And I'm gonna start by entering nine as the first guess. Please guess lower, you can see on the screen. Now there's quite a few tests to do here to check every possible path through the code. So let's guess correctly this time. I'm gonna enter five as the second guess. We get the message, well done, you guessed it printed by line 15. So if you're not sure, why the message came from line 15 rather than line 10, then run the program in the debugger to check that. I'm gonna run the program again. This time, I'm gonna enter one. So you can see we've got the message telling us to guess higher. So I'm going to enter five. Well done, you guessed it on the screen. And this output came from line 10. And again, if you're not sure why that's the case, make sure you run the code through the debugger, step through the code, and you'll see that that's the case. All right, the code's working when we guess correctly the second time, but what happens if we get the second guess wrong? Well, let's test that. So I'm gonna enter one again, and now I'm gonna enter nine. And as you see, that's not really very helpful. The program's terminated without telling us what happened. I wanted to show that you don't have to use elif and else clauses, but we really should use else here to print out a message when the second guess is wrong. So let's actually add the code. So I'm gonna come up to do that on uh, after line 10. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna press backspace so that my else is on the same level as the if. Else colon enter print on the next line parentheses. Sorry, you have not guessed correctly. And we wanna do the same thing when the guess is too low. And that's down here on line 18, which it will be when I type it. I'm backspacing again to make sure the else is at the same indentation level as the if, else, print, parentheses, double quotes. And of course that should be you have not guessed correctly, not you have guessed correctly, because of course that means the else is executed if the guess has not been entered correctly. Same down here, so sorry, you have not guessed correctly. Okay, I got it right in the end, all right. 
So again, I've mentioned it, but pay careful attention here to the indentation. The if and else keywords have to be indented to the same level. This now makes it very easy to see which else or elif goes with which if. The indentation is essential for Python to understand what we want it to do, but the added benefit is that it also makes the code easier for us to read. All right, so we're gonna run the program again now. And I'm just going to do the same thing. In my case, I'm gonna enter one as the first guess, nine as the second one. And this time we've got a message, sorry, you have not guessed correctly. So run the program yourself and experiment with different values for your guesses. The answer is always five, which is a bit boring, but has the advantage to make it easier to test the program. In other words, you know which messages to expect. All right, so in the next video, we'll look at more of the conditional operators. See you in the next video. All right, so let's talk more about conditional operators in Python. But before we look at other conditional operators, let's review the code from the last video. So on line six, we test to see if the original guess is less than five. If it is, we print another message and allow another guess. If the original guess is not less than five, then line 13 checks if it's greater than five using elif. We allow another guess if it's greater than five. If neither of those conditions are true, then the guess must have been equal to five. This is picked up by the final else on line 20. There are better ways to write code like this as we'll see shortly. We've duplicated exactly the same code in the if and elif blocks. The duplicate lines are lines eight to 12 and also 15 to 19. Whenever you see duplication like this happening, that's a good indication that it can be done better. For now though, this example has illustrated a number of important concepts. All right, so let's talk about if blocks. So a block can be quite complex, including further if and else blocks and much more contained within it. When testing for equality, we can't use a single equal symbol. The single equal is used for assigning values to variables. So when testing for equality, we have to use two equal signs, the equals equals. An if statement can include many elif parts, but there can only be one else. Elif, by the way, is short for else if. The else if there is one must come after all the elif blocks. Duplicating code is generally a bad idea. There's almost always a better way. When testing conditions, we can use any of the value comparison operators. Now there are other types of comparisons we can perform, but we'll focus on these six for now. Less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, equal to and not equal to. Once again, remember that we test for equality using the two equal symbols. That's something you'll forget at first, but you'll get a syntax error if you use a single equal, which should remind you. All right, so now we know how to test for not equal, we can simplify our program. What I'm gonna do is change the first condition on line six to check if the guess is not equal to the answer. Now, so that you can compare the new code with what we've got at the moment, I'm gonna comment out lines six through 21 and put the new code before it. In the, the JetBrains IDEs, you can comment out a block of code by using control slash or command slash on a Mac. So I'm gonna select line six through 21 Control slash in my case, because I'm on Windows. Now I'm not aware how to do of a way to do that in idle. You may have to edit uh, each line individually if you're using uh, idle. Now comments are ignored by the Python interpreter and they're there to document your code. In this case, the comments prevent the code from being executed. Generally, you should use them to explain what you've, when you've done something in a certain way or as a reminder of certain conditions or variable states that uh, may not be obvious by looking at the code. Remember that you may come back to modify code weeks or months or even years after you wrote it. Documentation can be extremely helpful when you work on another programmer's code for the first time or come back to your own code after a gap. In Python, comments, as you can see, start with the hash symbol and they actually can appear on a line on their own or at the end of a line of code. You can't place them in the middle of a line though. The hash inside the string is treated just like any other character and doesn't include a comment. If you want to comment or span several lines and start each line with a hash, as I've done here. All right, so let's now start typing in some new code. So I'm going to come up to the top here. And specifically, on line six, I'm going to start typing if guess is not equal, we're using the not equal comparison operator answer colon. And the next line, line seven, I'm going to do if guess 
is less than answer, colon, print, parentheses, double quotes, and please guess higher in those double quotes. Otherwise, I'm going to do an else, noting that I've gone indented back at the same level as the if on line 7. Else, colon. I'm going to put a comment here. Hash. This must be greater than answer. I'm going to print, or type in print, parentheses, double quotes, please guess lower. Then on the next line, I'm going to go back a level again. So I'm at the same level as the else now. Guess equals int, left parentheses, input left to right parentheses and closing right parentheses for our guess. Then I'm going to type if guess is equal to answer, so two equal signs, colon, print, parentheses, double quotes, and well done, you guessed it in double quotes. Else, again at the same level as the if, colon, print, parentheses, double quotes, sorry, you have not guessed correctly. Correctly. And then I'm going to go back, back again. So we're all the way to the left margin. Again, lined up with the if on line six, else colon, print, parentheses, double quotes. You got it first time. Okay, so there's our code. So once again, this highlights the importance of indentation in Python. Our second guess on line 11 is at the same indentation level as the if and else statements on line seven and nine. It's not dependent on either condition, in other words. We get a different message if guess is greater than five or less than five, but line 11 is executed regardless of the outcome of the if else clauses. I've also added a comment to the code on line nine. This makes it clear to any humans reading the code what's happening. If you were to read the inner block in isolation, it may not be obvious that the guess must be greater than five rather than a greater than equal to, i.e. not less than five. The comment draws attention to the fact that uh, we would not have got into the inner block if guess is equal to five. You can often do the same thing in many different ways, and this is an example of doing that. This new code does exactly the same thing as the previous code. That's the code now that has been commented out on lines 19 through 34. And I'm going to take the opportunity to remove our breakpoint there. Now this can often confuse new programmers because there's usually more than one way to do the same thing. Both of these bits of code will produce exactly the same results when given the same inputs. Of course, the code on lines 19 through 34 won't do anything now because they start with a hash. In other words, it's been commented out. They're ignored when we run the program. But if they weren't commented out, they'd uh, produce the same results as the code we've now got on lines 6 through 17. So let's check that by running the program to make sure that it still works. All right, so I'm going to use the same guesses that I used in the previous video. The first guess was 9, so I'm going to do that again. And we get the message, please uh, guess lower. I'm going to enter 5 as the second guess. Well done, you guessed it. I'm going to run the program again and uh, use 1 as our first guess. So please guess higher is output to the screen. 5, that's my second guess. Well done, you guessed it. So that's still working. Run it one more time. Run the program again. 1. This time we're going to enter 9. Sorry, you have not guessed correctly. So that's working fine and produces exactly the same results as the previous now commented out code. You uh, may also want to set breakpoints and run the code in the debugger. Remember to think about which lines should be executed before stepping over the conditions to verify your results. All right, so I'm going to finish this video now with a challenge and we'll go over the solution to the challenge in the next video. So the challenge is to change the condition on line 6 to if guess is equal to answer, and you saw that previously it was not equal to answer. So change it so it says if guess is equal to answer, and then change the program in the appropriate places to give the correct results. All right, so that's the challenge. See how you go with the challenge, and uh, we'll go over the solution to the challenge in the next video.